been like throughout the past three days. So we have just assembled a wonderful little panel of speakers who are going to come up here for a couple of minutes to give you a really energizing, galvanizing speech so that you can all go home inspired and energized and ready to take on the patriarchy. So, so here we have, you know, um, women from all over the world who are here to just give you a couple of words of wisdom before we go home. So can we start with Shereen Benjamin, please. Hello, sisters. Hasn't it been a wonderful conference? So I was thinking, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a demonstration in Edinburgh where I live in solidarity with the wonderful, brave women in Iran. I think lots of you will have been to similar demonstrations in your towns and in your cities. And I heard for the first time that chant, Women, Life, Freedom. And I found myself thinking about a woman I used to know a long time ago. She died when I was 10. The anglicized version of her name, I never knew the original, um, was Sophie Siegel, born in the 1890s in Imperial Russia. And she left Russia in the early 1900s as a girl of 15, fleeing the pogroms, the anti-Jewish violence. And she came to the UK and she was dressed as a boy to, so that she could work her passage on the ship as she made her unaccompanied way across Europe. And I now think that was to avoid um, being prostituted, which was the fate of many young girls who made that journey alone. Her name was Sophie Siegel. I called her Bubba. She was my grandmother. She died when I was 10. And because she made that hazardous journey, she gave me and her other descendants life and freedom. And I've been thinking about that slogan as we've um, enjoyed all the talks and listened to all the wonderful talks over the last three days. And I've been thinking about our collective grandmothers, you know, the few names that we know of that have resonated down the decades and the centuries, the women who've worked for life and freedom. Um, mostly the names we don't know, the countless women who've, you know, if all they could do was um, survive through unimaginable odds. They brought us life and freedom. And I've been thinking about them as I've listened to the fantastic women, the sisters from all over the world, about women working for life and freedom um, in fundamentalist regimes, women working for life and freedom from slavery, from prostitution, um, women closer to home, women in my own country of Scotland, working for life and freedom and for that definition for women to be able to define ourselves as a sex class and argue for our rights on that basis. And women all over the world fighting to gain or to retain freedom of expression, freedom of assembly that's so crucial to life and to freedom. And thinking about the women still to come, the young girls, the girls sold into prostitution, the young lesbians um, growing up in a porn-soaked culture, in a misogynist culture, and thinking that they have to identify their way out of being women, if such a thing were possible, and thinking about all the women yet to come. We are the future. We will be working for life and freedom. And as we go back to our homes now, the contribution of every woman in this hall and every woman who's been here over the past three days really, really matters. Every voice matters, every woman's contribution, whether we work in our homes and our families, in our communities, in our political parties, in our trade unions, in our wider campaigning, every contribution matters. Um, because we are the future, we're creating the future that the women of, um, of the future will be growing into. And speaking of the future, we're really, really excited in Scotland to be welcoming Philia next year. And if you think, this is controversial, if you think in Wales they know how to party, just you wait till you come to Scotland. <laughs> in Glasgow. We are the future, we are women, we are life, we are freedom. The struggle continues. See you in Glasgow next year, and I'm handing over to Caitlin. I've come all the way from Australia to be with all you wonderful women, and I'm so excited. 
I'm from an Australian grassroots campaigning movement called Collective Shout for a World Free of Sexploitation. And we campaign against the objectification of women and sexualization of girls in media, advertising, and popular culture. And we challenge objectification because objectification is the foundation of men's violence against women in all its forms. When women are seen as objects, as things, as existing for men's sexual use and pleasure, then it becomes really easy to justify violence against us. So it, it starts with objectification. It's not always easy working in this space. We have our fair share of opposition from those who have an investment in women's continued objectification and maintaining women's object status and profiting from this. We've also been sued by Sexpo, we won. <laughs> and we've made enemies of men's rights activists, pedophiles and their supporters and pimps, which we're really torn up about. <laughs> We're also having to push back against this dominant narrative now that female objectification can be actually empowering for women. But when we are told that treating women as bodies or mere parts of bodies, things to be used, is empowering, when we're told that being subjected to violent, degrading, painful and abusive porn sex acts for men's sexual gratification empowers women, and when we're told that men's paid sexual access to the bodies of women in the sex trade empowers women, the word empowering has lost all meaning. <laughs> women are sold the lie that they can reclaim their own objectification and that this is a feminist choice. Who benefits from this? We know. That's right, we know who benefits from this. Women are not empowered by objectification. Women are empowered by their resistance of it. And for more than a decade at Collective Shout, we've been running campaigns, like I said, against the sexual exploitation of women and girls. And we've had a lot of victories over this time. We've seen sexist advertising withdrawn. We've seen sexualized products like padded push-up bras for preteen girls pulled from sale. We've seen porn mags fold as a result of our campaigns. And, <laughs> and more recently, we've seen child sex abuse dolls. These are replica dolls, replica girls, uh, toddlers and babies, dolls modeled on their bodies, marketed for men's sexual use. We've seen these products pulled from major online global platforms as a result of our campaigns. <laughs> And I tell you this because what I want you to understand is that these victories were only achieved because women spoke out. Women refused to accept the status quo and they fought and we will continue to fight. So what I want all of you to know is that you can speak out too. We have every right to speak out. Our humanity is being denied. We're being reduced to disposable objects and our degradation and abuse is pitched as men's sexual entertainment. We're right to be angry, we're right to speak out. So you might think that your voice doesn't have much power, but I promise you it does. And when we put all of our voices together, we have a lot of power. So I just wanna say that together we can fight, we can speak out, we can fight for a better world for women, for girls, and for our daughters. So let's fight together. And next up is Luba Fine. I want to ask all of you uh, to support uh, uh, promoting the Nordic model in the UK. Uh, Nordic model is a legal system for uh, which purpose is to combat uh, the sex trade. And uh, it has uh, two main parts. One is uh, assisting women uh, who are willing to exit the sex trade. And uh, another one is uh, holding uh, the third party profiteers and sex buyers accountable. And uh, the second part is not just about justice, it is uh, also about helping women because uh, third party profiteers and sex buyers, uh, they are the economic force behind the sex industry, behind co commercialized sexual abuse of women. Uh, 
So what you can do is uh, support any campaign NGO project uh, which is focused on uh, promoting uh, the Nordic model in the UK and you have uh, several NGOs. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Philia. In Philia, we have uh, the Women First project now and uh, Philia in general is uh, also focused uh, uh, on uh, combating the sex trade. Uh, we, in the UK, you also have the Nordic model now. You, my sister, a support group for sex trade survivors, a model for Scotland, which is uh, focused on Scotland. And uh, if you ever, ever encounter this uh, liber neoliberal discourse that uh, we should not interfere because some women uh, choose being in the sex trade, just remember, Prostitution kills women, whether they choose it or not. So let's focus on our own choice to stop commercialized sexual abuse of women. Thank you. And uh, our next speaker will be Harriet Wistrich. I've got about a million things to talk about. I wanted to start by just saying, um, the times we live in are very, very bleak, and we're constantly dealing with the most horrendous abuse of women. It seems often as though things are getting worse. And, uh, you know, many times people say, you know, how do you keep going? Well, we can keep going because we can um, make change, and we have to keep going as we have no choice. But we can achieve change. We can achieve victory. And we can uh, do that by working together uh, in our different areas, whether we are uh, activists on the street, whether we are lawyers, whether we are politicians, whatever way, we, we have to come together and we can uh, change things. And my own experience um, in uh, feminism started with, um, in particular, with the Justice for Women campaigns and the case of Emma Humphreys. In past years at Philia, we've, we've delivered the Emma Humphreys Awards. This time last year, we gave an award to Natalie Page, who's done fantastic work around family justice, and to uh, a woman called Daisy, who um, was born uh, out of rape, and who has campaigned uh, to get those children born of rape to be recognized as victims. And uh, there, there, there is movement in relation to that, and this may happen uh, in, as part of the Victims Bill. It's now been recommended. Um, so uh, just by kind of raising our voices, we can make change. Um, and uh, in the Center for Women's Justice, which we formed uh, six years ago, we have, we have made an impact, and we have uh, brought the police uh, it, onto their knees. Uh, if, we, if we see them now, uh, you know, in utter disgrace about the abuse, uh, police perpetrated abuse, and uh, being uh, forced to, to do something to try and root out the, the rotten core of policing. And we can see the decriminalization. We know that rape is virtually decriminalized, but there is a fight against that, and we have brought legal challenges around that. And we can uh, challenge uh, the, the, the failures that exist, and we can try to find ways to um, hold the, the authorities to account. We have to, we have to hold the authorities to account in whichever way we can, uh, whether it is by protest, whether it is by legal action, and, whether, and by coming together in whatever way we can. Um, and um, we have a, um, you know, another battle on our hands, the case of uh, Martina Oganowska, a young woman, an 18-year-old woman who was um, uh, convicted of the murder of a man who was trying to sexually assault her. Um, and the reason she was convicted was because the Crown Prosecution Service um, claimed that her earlier allegation of rape was a false allegation because the police had failed to investigate it. it. That case is coming up to an appeal. We want everyone to support that appeal. And we want to uh, uh, come together and fight all the legal cases, all the atrocities by all the different um, criminal justice agencies. We can hold them to account. And we know that we are a thorn in their side. Um, so um, I, I just think in whatever situation you find yourself in, uh, find ways to, to hold the authorities to account, to hold men to account, to hold uh, perpetrators to account, because it is possible, and we just 
have to keep going. And uh, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Yasmin, who's from Brazil um, and from Valvanigra. First of all, I would like to thank you all again and to thank Filia for the invitation. Because for me, being here is not only represent the Vulva Negra project or me or the woman from, from my country, but it also represents all black women that has been silenced. <laughs> all black women that still fighting for sex-based women rights. And especially, I feel like I'm here for the women in Brazil that can speak for themselves now. We need to look at the situation of indigenous women in Brazil, indigenous girls in Brazil that had been raped, that have been uh, taken apart of their families, and that has stolen their lands and their villages. So we need to look and to address those kinds of situation in Brazil. Because I founded the Vuvo Negro Project in 2018 when I was was only 18 years old, and people asked me where do I find my strange to even when I was a teenager start to do something like this. And I say, and I said to them that I found my straight and the woman and the black woman in Brazil that were leading the revolution in my country. Because a lot of people don't know, but even the independence of Brazil has begun in my region, in the northwestern of Brazil, in Bahia, and women like Dandara, that was a black Kilimbala woman, was one of the leaders of the revolution that uh, led us up to our independence in my country. So when people ask, how can an 18 years old girl has this strength, I can do then. Woman, woman from my country, black woman from my community, they always had this kind of strength. They always have it. And I feel like I'm here today to share it with, it with you. My message, my message to women today is, you are not alone. They want us to feel afraid, to feel alone, to feel like we cannot organize and make a movement, but this is a lie. You are not alone. You, girl, you women that are listening to this, we are not alone. They're trying to say to us, no, people don't believe you, people don't believe in sex and sex-based women's rights. But we need to keep fighting because there are girls and women that can't speak for themselves, that are silenced that can speak about what really matters. So we are here for us, but we are here too for them, for all of them. So because of this, I just want to thank and again, Philia, and to thank you all for this beautiful opportunity and just keep it in mind. Look at black Brazilian women movement. Look at indigenous Brazilian women movement. We need to be together. We need to stand together for women that can speak now in Brazil. So thank you very much. And I would like to introduce amazing people. That should make you feel happy about the future, isn't it? How old are you? 22. 22. <laughs> As she said it, and I'm gonna repeat it for you. Women, please recognize your power. Women, you are an amazing in human beings on earth. You are multitasker, you are powerful in any way you can think of. You create humanity in you. You bring humanity out of you. That alone is what threatens the whole world. They want to please what goes in, what goes out. They want to tell us how to live. They want to tell us what we are. They want to tell us everything under the sun to suppress us. But guess what? We can't be suppressed. We can't be silenced. We can't be pushed to the corner. We don't allow that. We don't. 
We don't allow that. We can't allow that. And the reason that we can't allow that is we have a duty, duty to protect the future generations. We have a duty to speak up for them, to make sure that they grow up and they have the fire that we have, the ancestors had for the rights that we have today. There are women who gave life to what we have today. We can't let this world repackage, rename, yeah? Retell us what we should be, or call us like best, you know, you know, best feeders, bleeders, this and that. We are not, we are freaking women, get over it. We are simple. We are very, very simple. We're just women. We're not coming to your territory. We're not attacking you. We're not telling you how to grow your penis or not to grow your penis. We're not telling you what to do with it. We're not. So bugger off and leave us women to be women. Leave us alone. Let us be women. Let us continue to be women. Roar, my sisters, roar. Roar, roar. Stand together. Stand together and say no. We're not taking you, taking us down. We will fight you every step of the way. And we are united. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're indigenous, wherever you are, womanhood, we have the humanity glue that none, any other person can't have. Please treasure that. Support each other as much as you can. Pass the colors, pass the skin of color, pass the religion, see the woman just like you. Trust me when I tell you that. We are all the same. It doesn't matter what part of the world we come from. We all are the same. We are oppressed, we are tortured, we are killed, we are sold, we are misused, we are misplaced. Our community see us as a commodities. We are sold, we are dispensable. And we cannot allow that to continue anymore. Get involved, be, bro be brave, be bold, but most of all, be a freaking woman fighting that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Follow, educate, not mutilate. Take your phones out. Give us a follow on Twitter and on, on, on Instagram. And now I welcome the stage to Hilly Hilakama. Uh, do you know uh, Nina Simone's song? I wish I would know how it feels to be free. Okay, I, can you sing it? Because I cannot carry it tune. Okay, Google it after. I think we don't know how it feels to be free, but there are some moments that we get a glimpse to it, and Philia was one of these moments. Philia. And I think that's why men are really scared of women-only places, because when we are together, like Elena, uh, who her and Natasha, the Serbian women, are one of the many gifts that we got connecting to them through, through Philia. She said earlier uh, in response to one of the panel, when women are together in a women-only space, the magic happens. So when we're in women-only space, we can, we, we can speak our truth and we can cry and laugh and yell and cheer and talk about our reality and strategize and analyze and get a glimpse of how it feels to be free gets us a vision and a place to start from and then retreat from when we try to break the bricks of patriarchy until we're going to dismantle this wall. So clearly, Philia and all the things and all the great moments and the great connections and the great love reinforce the need of a women-only place. So. Thank you for that, and we will keep doing our fight. And I'm calling on you that doesn't matter what avenue, what fight, what um, stream of uh, radical feminism you're taking on, also make sure you are part of, you're taking advantage of, you're benefiting of defending and maintaining women-only space. So let's clap. I wanted to tell you is that uh, when I grow up, I want to be Vanshavni Sudner. <laughs> I want to make brilliant feminist films. 
that are telling the truth, that are um, critical, changing our thinking, and they are offering um, a powerful call to action. So it's a beautiful Vashnavi. Uh, last year at Philia, I had a session on femicide. And I talked in detail about the various ways in which Indian women are subjected to so many different forms of misogyny. A year has passed, and I'm heartbroken to say that I could probably redo a session in femicide where I'm talking about a completely new set of ways in which women are dealing with misogyny in India. In 2023, it is expected that India's population is gro going to be more than China. 1.4 billion people, which means half of that are women. So many more women to get exploited, so many more women to get abused, but so many more women to resist that misogyny as well. I look around me, there are so many young women. I ask them their age and I'm shocked because some say they are 19, 20, 21, and I'm trying to think very hard what I was doing at that time. I was thinking that, you know, there is a feminist movement somewhere and the feminists are doing their best to, you know, save the world and things like that. I realize now that all of us are those feminists. Every one of us are those feminists who are going to change the world. And when these young women in India gradually send me these private messages saying that they see my work and they are grateful for it and hopefully in future they would also like to speak up about it. All those distressing days where I wake up and I think, should I even get out of bed today, makes it worth uh, all the ordeal. I just want to leave you with one single thing. It's very, very hard to fight the misogyny that we face world over. In India, in the northeastern part of uh, uh, the country, a lot of women are resisting uh, misogyny in their own ways. In the south, they're doing it in their own ways. In the north, they're doing it in their own ways. But as a country, we have not unified together to understand that there are so many different forms of misogyny and we have not aligned into agreeing that all forms of misogyny should be said no to. But there are pockets of resistance here and there. I hope that someday everybody believe that sex work is not work, porn is not empowering, and I hope someday that we will be able to free women from the fiction that you can change your sex and you can flee womanhood. It's not possible. I'm sometimes very, very afraid to think the damages this might cause, but I'm also equally hopeful that the young women are gradually starting to speak up and that gives me hope. I just want to leave you this, with this one little thing. Every day, get up and please do some form of resistance. It doesn't matter what size it is. Just wake up, show up and speak up. Thank you. And now my favorite person on stage, sorry. <laughs> Sally Jackson. Just realized I've got so many sheroes behind me, not intimidating at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this weekend we were really proud at Philia to launch our Women First project. It's a project that's been brewing since lockdown, where we started to notice newspaper articles in local papers that was framing prostitution as antisocial behaviour, a nuisance in the neighbourhood, and the effect on residential or business area was more important without people thinking about why it was, what was the poverty that had led women to being in that situation. And specifically in lockdown, um, what was happening in women's lives that they were forced to be out on the streets during a pandemic. So I started writing letters um, to every area where there was something in the paper around prostitution that was speaking about it in that way. I wrote to the council, the police, the crime commissioner, um, politicians. Um, I really didn't mind who it was that I bothered. Um, and in that letter, we suggested there's a better way of dealing with this. And of course, that better way is a way that frames it as violence against women and puts the priority about reducing and ending the harm to women. That better way is the Nordic model. During that time, we wrote, 11, we wrote 13 letters and we got a whole four replies. But one of those early replies was from Plymouth in Devon. And we got invited to their domestic and sexual violence meeting to discuss it more. And listening at that meeting was the brilliant CEO of Trevi Women's Centre, Hannah Sheed. 
And after that, that meeting, she got in contact and with a kick-ass local feminist on board, with things started to change. Trevi was already doing some wonderful women-centered work and this fitted well with their ethos. So over the year, Hannah kept in contact and we were able to introduce her to the totally awesome Julie Swede. <laughs> Together, they did an amazing piece of work in Plymouth, working with the local women, finding out what support was useful and helpful to them. We managed to get a small grant so that we could have a pilot project to try and explore how we could do more with this in other areas. We wanted to ensure that as in the work in Plymouth, all the work was co-produced with the experts, women with lived experience. And so we asked a filial volunteer, fearless campaigner, Luba Fine, to come and do some interviews for us with UK women to find out what they thought would be helpful and what their roots were into prostitution. And that information was the basis on which we built the project. Just a couple of examples. They told us, for instance, that no money was worth the feeling it gave me. That they wanted to exit since the very first day. It was horrendous. It was man after man after man. It was being raped continually. And when we asked them about what would help, you won't be surprised here. More safe spaces. Where I'd feel I'd be able to talk about my views and my personal experience. And I think that had only come in a feminist space, a woman-only space. We need more of that. And importantly as well, they said to us, we need to know there's a light at the end of the tunnel and that people do exit. We never hear about that. So based on that, we realised we had Hannah and Julie working in Plymouth, Luba talking with the women who'd exited, and of course we knew we were coming to Wales this year. So thanks to the Philia Legacy Project, we got introduced to the feminist dynamo that is Ali Morris. Uh, <laughs> and she had such great contacts in Swansea. Our team was complete. We spent the next few months, sorry, since March last year, we brought the wisdom from those interviews together into a simple toolkit. And we wanted to make it really easy for local areas to adopt this new approach. And the approach is about a change of ethos. It's about refocusing the work that's already happening, the work of sexual health, substance use uh, services, violence against women and girls services coming together. Recognizing that working with women who are still involved in prostitution is skilled work. But it's often something that's an add-on to someone else's job or something that's given to volunteers. And while they come with lots of passion and lots of empathy, they don't necessarily have the skills and the training to deal with the very complex and complicated issues that are in women's lives. So we developed a tool so that we could, ask, we could show areas how they could measure what the access to their services were like, what the understanding of the women working on the ground was like, and what they knew about the knowledge and experience of local women. From this, they can prioritise what they need to put in place to work to a violence against women framework. And we realised that what they needed was to raise their aspirations for these women. So personally, I'd like to thank Julie, Hannah, Luba and Ali. It's been inspiring to work with them and we're getting to the point where this weekend we've launched the kit. There are copies of the toolkit at the side of the stage there. Please do take some before you go. What we want is for you to share it with your local area. Persuade them to get involved. And maybe if you're wondering what's going to change as a result of being at Philia this year, it's up to you, but maybe it could be the lives of some of the most vulnerable women where you live. So thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to introduce Cathy Larkman from uh, White Women's Rights Network in Wales. Around our pub, pub, good afternoon. Hello. A year ago, I was standing on the steps of the Welsh Senedd in Cardiff, our government building, at the Can the Plan rally, standing shoulder to shoulder with my sisters, demanding that the Welsh government listen to the concerns of women across Wales. Welsh government haven't been listening to women in Wales. We represent some very unfortunate truths to them that they don't want to hear. And those truths are our sex-based rights. Not only have they not been protecting our rights, in fact, they've been hell-bent on diminishing them. And we've been excluded from a seat at the table of influence. Shame on them. <laughs> However, several weeks ago, along with Philia, we managed to invite ourselves 
along to a local meeting where the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford, was present, and we directly asked him to engage with our groups. We received an agreement in that meeting uh, that a further meeting would take place. So watch this space. We can do things, we just have to make it happen. As Welsh women today, we are not always as visible as the rest of our sisters across the United Kingdom. But we are carrying on the tradition of brave Welsh women of our past, women who campaigned at Greenham Common and during the miners' strike, and we do not forget them. All of this makes this weekend of filia, of sisterhood, of solidarity in our Welsh capital all the more important. 1,700 women have come together to discuss issues affecting us, including the abuses of patriarchy, as previous speakers have referred to. We are stronger together as women. As the Women's Rights Network in Wales and as Merched Cymru, we organised the Saturday Rally. We gathered together in the pouring rain outside in Cardiff to say that on behalf of all raped women and raped girls, our sisters, that rape and sexual violence is never her fault. Beth Ari Bai. And we demand change in the criminal justice system. My own personal work at the moment is challenging the disgraceful policy of the National Police Chiefs Council to decide that women will no longer be entitled to an officer of the same sex when they are subjected to a strip or intimate search. This is a national scandal. We've been joined by so many inspirational women and younger women. Evie, I'm looking at you. Uh, here this weekend in Wales, we want to say thank you to all of you for coming, for coming together. We're stronger together. Dioch and vow to all of you amazing women for your fortitude, your sisterhood, your solidarity. And I want to say thank you as well to everybody involved in Philia, everybody who's made it possible here today. Lisa Marie, Leanne Timmerman, thank you, and everybody else. You've all been absolutely incredible. So as we now hand on the baton to our Celtic sisters in Scotland, we're already planning our visit, obviously from Wales, and we want to say good luck, poor luck, to our sisters in Scotland. So from the Welsh dragons of Wales to those formidable Scottish women who just won't wished. <laughs> so Eden. And can I say at this moment that I am clenching So I'm going to hand over to the incredible Elaine Miller and see you all next year. Um, this was my first filia. Give me a cheer if it's your first filia. Nobody told me I needed to pack more hankies. Who spent the whole time in tears? You've either been laughing and weeping or weeping from despair. It's an emotional roller coaster. I have loved it. Loved it. I've spoken to, I think the youngest woman I've spoken to was 12 and the oldest was, eight, oh, great, was 86. And this is what intersectional feminism looks like. I have met women from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, who have lives radically different from my own, of all different ages and abilities, and I have noticed how much work Philia has put into in making life easier and more accessible so that women can come here. And this, is this organization has run this event entirely for the benefit of female people. And 
I can't tell you how much joy I've had from that. It's been an absolute pleasure because I live in Scotland and um, Scotland's under the impression, well, my government are under the impression that they can build themselves to be the global leaders in providing women's health without defining what a woman is. And I think that's quite a hard gig. Um, <laughs> So I'm a physiotherapist, I work in pelvic health, I'm a fanny physio, and it's been really heartening <laughs> to wander around and see all these women squinting at me as I go by, because they're doing their pelvic floor exercises, it's wonderful. My friend Lucy Brett wrote a book called PMSL, pissing myself laughing because she had a birth injury and she understood the impact of incontinence on a woman's life, I would recommend you read it. It's a really, really good book, not just because she was nice to me in it. Um, but in it, she said that your pelvic floor holds your whole life together. And it really struck me because it is true. That if you are having problems controlling your own body, then it stops you from shouting because you're gonna wet yourself. And my goodness, we need to shout. Women's health is underfunded, it's under-researched, it's hard to access at the moment. Services have been absolutely decimated because of COVID and they don't seem to be coming back. And I have some opinions about that, which I've tried to share with my government, but they don't seem to be listening. 50% um, of women in the UK aren't very sure about which is a vulva and which is a vagina, because we don't teach you. So if you don't know the basics of your own body, how can you look after it? How can you make it feel good? If you're not sure, if you're looking at it, it's a vulva. And if you or a wee friend is fishing about in there, it's a vagina. Vulva, vagina. Thank you for coming. So a vagina is a reactive and responsive organ. It is part of our bodies that is inherent because of our femaleness. It is not a whole which can be surgically replicated. It is reactive. A vagina is reactive and responsive and it turns out so is the rest of me. I would like to understand who benefits from women's ignorance about our own bodies, because it's not us. And I suspect it's because they know that it silences us, it takes away your confidence. You, it is very, very hard to scream at the patriarchy if you're worried about these issues. Audre Lorde said, caring for yourself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. I suspect that the editors took out the wee bit at the end of that, which was, so do your pelvic floor exercises. <laughs> I live in Edinburgh, which is very pretty, and was the seat of the Scottish Enlightenment, and it now seems it is the seat of the Scottish Entitlement, and I am not having it. At Philia, I have learned that courage calls. There are brave women here, and it is infectious. So I think we need our own social contagion. I think we're working on it. Thank you very much for having me and, and coming to hear me speak. It's been an absolute thrill. And so I'm handing over to a woman who doesn't seem to have managed to wish just yet, Raquel Rosario, Rosario Sanchez, who is spokeswoman and trustee of Philia. Thank you. Rinhao da Pau. My worthy book, on wake board, on hungry, and the old on bauer. I've just said. 
Good afternoon, everybody. It has been so great to be here at in Wales, and thank you. So right now, I would like all our speakers to join us on stage because it is time to thank every single person who has made this wonderful conference possible. So can you join me so that we can thank everyone? Let's start with our fabulous signer and the speech to text women who have delivered the speeches. Thank you so much to the women who are filming and the photographers who we have in the room. They are making sure that these moments are preserved. You know, we, we have to say thank you to the stall holders and the artists who have produced these beautiful t-shirts and all the beautiful art. Um, I want to thank the absolutely lovely women who have been running the, uh, the crash, because obviously without a crash, an event like this would not be possible. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if we could thank the venue, St. David's Hall, it's been lovely, and the venue staff who have been so kind to all of us. Thank you. venue and the venue staff and I want to thank our 150 speakers who have just been so phenomenal all of you our speakers have been fantastic can we say thank you to our security including the wonderful Leanne wonderful security who are making sure that you're all safe and protected here. I want to say thank you to all of you, our 1,700 attendees who have made Philia possible. You know, we, we can plan, but if the women don't come, then it's like, what's the point? So thank you. Um, and then finally, Thank you to the phenomenal, incredibly hardworking Philia team. All volunteers. Thank you. Thank you to all of the Philia volunteers who are making this possible. And, and also, I just wanted to say, we're looking forward to having you next year at the Philia Conference 2023. The dates are going to be from the 13th to the 15th of October in Glasgow, Scotland. So thank you, everyone. Have a safe journey home. Thank you.